the ability to start your car with the turn of a key and not a crank, you can thank American inventor Charles Kettering. He once said, I'm interested in the future because I expect to spend the rest of my life there. To me, sometimes it feels like the future sneaks up on you. Actually, the older I get, the faster it sneaks up on me. In reality, the future comes just one day at a time. These days, most new cars start with a push button, not a key. Soon, cars will be driving themselves. We live in a constant cycle of change. This includes our local economies. As elected officials, economic change means knowing who in my community has a job and who is looking for a job. It includes knowing if a new service is affordable or if it isn't. Our evolving economic realities influence economic development, municipal revenue, and local services. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speakers who will explore this topic in greater detail. Our first speaker is Matthew Wilson. He's a senior advisor with AMO. Matthew will show you how the property tax burden across the province has shifted over time. Stephen Van Offwagen is the Commissioner of Finance and Chief Financial Officer, Officer for the Region of Peel. Peel looked at the impact of the disruptive economy, changing land use patterns and aging population and income inequality. Matthew and Stephen will illustrate implications that affect every corner of this province. These changes are happening today, the future is now, and we are living it. It is my pleasure to welcome Matthew Wilson to the stage. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to share the stage with Stephen Van Offelgen. The work that Peel has done has been very beneficial. It prompted AMO to consider the broader implications for our community of communities. You heard this morning from Max Valiquet about the disruptive economy, its trends, and how the pace of change will accelerate. We cannot turn a blind eye to this change. You heard from Max that artificial intelligence is the ability of a machine or a computer to learn and problem solve. Google Maps uses artificial intelligence to show you the fastest route. Uber uses artificial intelligence to predict travel times and calculate charges. Siri and Alexa are voice-activated virtual assistants. Both use AI to understand what it is that you are saying. This is all happening today. Unlike Max or Steven, I am not going to talk about the future. I don't need to. Innovation and economic change are already affecting who is footing the bill, who is paying the property tax burden. Our economy and the property tax burden is in continuous transition. And as Max said this morning, a series of iterations. I'm going to give you two examples that your constituents can relate to. First, let me take you back, way back, to the turn of the century in 2001. That year, there were 361 blockbuster video stores across Canada. You heard Max discuss this this morning. Each one of those stores paid municipal property taxes. The big disruption that year was that Blockbuster was replacing half of its existing VH in inventory with the latest innovative product, the DVD. Nationwide, it was a $300 million business employing thousands. Globally, the company was valued at $5 billion. Ten years later, in 2011, all remaining Canadian stores closed and the company was bankrupt. Property tax revenues ceased. Netflix started as a DVD by mail rental company in 1997. By 2010, its video streaming service came to Canada. Today, there are over 7 million Canadian household subscribers. The days of jumping in the car and going to the video store on a Friday night are truly over. 
In 2018, Netflix hired its first and only Canadian employee, employee based in Canada. As far as the subscription side of the business goes, there are no physical locations, no storefronts. Netflix does the same business as Blockbuster and even more, but it uses the internet, it pays no property tax, and it has a very limited payroll. Let me give you one more example. Eaton's was once the largest department store in Canada. In 1997, it had 2,000, uh, sorry, 24,500 employees in 90 retail outlets across Canada. After 130 years of operation, by 1999, it had declared bankruptcy. Sears Canada purchased its assets. By 2018, Sears Canada suffered a similar fate and closed its doors for good. Eaton's and Sears were once prominent locations in many downtowns and many retail malls, including the Rideau Hall next door. They paid their share of property taxes to municipal governments. It's hard not to be a little nostalgic, even if you never set foot in a store. The arrival of the Eaton's or Sears catalog was an event for many households. Who can forget the door stopper mail order catalogs with shaving babies and the fashions of yesteryear, the highlight into our history? Enter Amazon, the world's largest e-commerce store. Amazon is so much more than Eaton's or Sears. It sells movies, groceries, digital comics, and books of all kinds, audio, digital, and traditional. There are departments within departments at Amazon, and it all gets delivered right to your door within a day or two. Amazon started its operations in Canada in 2002. Last year, the company employed 10,000 people in Canada in 11 distribution centers. Compare that to the Eaton's of 1997 with nearly 25,000 employees. Amazon has a workforce that is 60% smaller, and it operates out of 11 locations compared to the original 90 Eaton's stores. Fewer locations means less municipal property tax is paid in Ontario. I've picked, you, picked two retail examples to illustrate the shift that is underway, an economy in transition. I could just as easily talked about industries such as manufacturing, auto assembly, steel production, saw mills, or paper mills. I'll give you some of those examples in a moment. And I'm sure that right now you are thinking of your own examples locally. There are secondary consequences to these changes that affect you as elected officials. The tax revenues that fix bridges, build transit, buy a police car, hire an officer, add a childcare space, or provide a long-term bed are all affected by these developments. What does this mean to the residential property taxpayer? What does this mean from the people from whom you are collecting property taxes and providing service? To be clear, property taxes are influenced by many, many factors. Local service levels, grants from the provincial or federal government, council priorities and variable user fees all have a role to play. But what is especially important is the fact that every local economy is different. What I'm going to illustrate to you is the shifting mix of industrial and commercial property taxes paid versus the load carried by people, the residential property taxpayer. In 2017, 68% of all property taxes, lower tier, upper tier, and education, were residential. Over 17 years, that share has increased by nine percentage points across the sector. Back in 2001, 59% of property taxes collected were residential. This 9% shift from 2001 to 2017 represents about $2.5 billion. 
Depending on where you live in the province and the number and size of commercial properties that you have in your community, that share will change. I want to be clear that there's no right or wrong answer here. But across Ontario, the residential share has increased in nearly 90% of all municipalities since 2001. Let me give you a couple of specific examples. Iroquois Falls is located 70 kilometers northeast of Timmins. In December 2017, residents learned that the Resolute Paper Mill would permanently close. The closure led to the loss of 180 jobs and 18% of the town's property tax revenue. In 2010, the residential share was 44%. In 2017, it's 60%. It's a similar story in Marathon, 300 kilometers east of Thunder Bay. Its pulp plant closed in 2009. Since that time, the residential share has increased from 44% to 60%. That's a 16% increase in 10 years. These are two dramatic examples, but they il illustrate the vulnerability of one industry towns to the effects on residential rates. And that change is compounded if household incomes drop or unemployment increases. Two more examples. In St. Thomas, the residential share has increased from 58% in 2001 to 74% in 2017. With two major auto assembly plant closures, one in 2008, the other in 2011, one in seven residents lost their job. Moving to the east now, the township of Sterling Rodden has experienced population decline. That has been a significant factor in its residential share increasing from 84 to 89%. I've only given you four examples. If you would like to experience the results for your community, we have developed a map resource for you. If you've downloaded the AMO conference app, you will receive a, ver a notification very shortly. You will find the map under general information on the app. For those of you on a desktop, here is the link to AMO's website, amo.on.ca slash taxmap. What does all of this mean? Here is the bottom line. The property tax burden is gradually shifting to residential taxpayers. This is the local reality for Ontarians in nearly 90% of all municipalities across the province. Province-wide, the residential share has increased 9% since 2001. How will regional economic differences, demographics, employment, wages, and affordability compound the impact of this ongoing shift. In a changing economy, one that is less tied to land, can the property tax system continue to equitably distribute the load between commercial, industrial, and residential? I'm simply highlighting a historic trend that shows that we are asking more and more of the residential property taxpayer. And I'm suggesting to you that the evolving economy will accelerate this impact. I think it is also important to acknowledge what I have not talked about today. I have not discussed the municipal infrastructure deficit, the provincial deficit, changes to cost share programs, uploads, downloads, provincial grants, or the future. This is also a big part of the municipal fiscal reality, which I will discuss in the Trillium Room at 3.30 this afternoon. In a moment, I'm going to turn the, the stage over to Stephen Van Offligen, who will share with you some of the specifics of the situation in Peel, which you will find insightful and relevant. We thank Peel very sincerely for its leadership on this issue. AMO will continue to monitor the situation. And in particular, we will look to the assessment cycle update to signal any acceleration of these trends. When you leave this conference, what can you do as the stewards of local services funded by property tax? 
you can value the importance and relative stability of the property assessment system in recent years. Property assessment is of enduring importance to municipal finances. Enid Slack from the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance will be speaking on this stage tomorrow morning at 8.30 on that topic. You can appreciate the significance of knowing that this trend is occurring. Knowledge is power. Data matters, and it can inform future policy positions. You can take comfort in knowing that your municipality is not alone. Fiscal realities unite all municipalities. And finally, you can see that there is strength in numbers. Your AMO membership delivers the value of learning, of understanding, and the opportunity to shape the future together. It is now my pleasure to introduce Stephen Van Offergen. Thank you. Thank you and, and good afternoon. I'm pleased to share the stage with Matthew Wilson. I think we shared each other's notes or something, but presenting on a topic which has far-reaching consequences to all municipalities. Recently, as, as Matthew noted, we, the Region of Peel, completed a socioeconomic study to understand how the changing nature of employment is impacting Peel's fiscal sustainability. But before I get started, I'd like to provide a little bit of context about the Region of Peel. Peel is home to Pearson International Airport, has five 400 series highways and moves over $1.8 billion of goods each and every day. Peel continues to be one of Canada's fastest growing municipalities. In fact, Peel's population is forecast to grow by the size of the city of Hamilton, reaching close to 2 million people by 2041. Over this time period, the province is also forecasting an additional 250,000 jobs coming to Peel. While this context may be different for your municipalities, Stay with me because I think you'll see that the disruptive economy is change and the changing nature of employment is not just a pure matter. This is something that affects all municipalities. So to support this growth, Peel is going to be required to make significant infrastructure investments estimated at close to $9 billion. Today, Peel is fiscally sound and one of seven Canadian municipalities to hold two AAA credit ratings. So one might think, why would Peel be concerned about the changing nature of employment. Going back to 2013, the Region of Peel adopted a long-term financial planning, our first long-term financial planning strategy. The strategy acts as a lens to inform council decision making, ensuring that regional services are both affordable today and sustainable for the future. As a requirement of the strategy, we prepare an annual assessment of the risks to Peel's long-term financial condition. The results of the assessment and the strategies being undertaken to mitigate identified risks are re then reported to Council. The strategy is guided by a set of principles and performance indicators under the pillars of financial sustainability, financial vulnerability, and financial flexibility. This slide demonstrates Peel's financial principles and metrics under the pillar of financial sustainability. Under the pillar of financial uh, vulnerability and highlighted by the red circles, we've identified two emerging risks, which will be the, my focus today. First, an increased risk associated with debt financing Peel's growth-related infrastructure requirements. And second, a decline in the proportion of non-residential property tax revenue. The next slide represents Peel's financial principles and metrics as they relate to financial flexibility. Collectively, Peel's long-term financial planning strategy is effective in identifying risk to financial sustainability and informing council decision-making. Ultimately, the rigor behind our long-term financial planning process improves stakeholder trust and confidence in the region of Peel. So I'm now going to explain a little bit about how we address the two, two of the risks that were identified through our long-term financial planning strategy. Municipal revenue sources in Ontario are limited, and more so for municipalities other than Toronto. Primary sources of revenue, property taxes and development charges, are in effect taxes and fees on land use. Consequently, municipalities are highly vulnerable to changes in land use. As the province addresses its priorities and fiscal challenges, municipalities may for, will face further upward pressure on property taxes. Now, driving a little bit more detail on how these primary revenue sources have performed in Peel, first, Peel collects development charges to fund our infrastructure such as water, wastewater, and roads to support population and employment growth, as forecasted by the province. Most of this infrastructure is required to be in place prior to any development occurring. As such, 
we, we had to debt finance th those works. Over the past 30 years, Peel invested in growth-related infrastructure based on historical patterns of land consumption. As shown on the left side of this slide, between 2002 and 2017, Peel's non-residential development charge revenues have fallen short of forecast by over $830 million. As the infrastructure is required to be in place prior to development, Peel incurred debt financing of $1.4 billion. We built the field of dreams. However, serviced, serviced employment lands were not being consumed as forecast. In 2014, Council instituted a growth management program to address a growing debt burden. To date, this program reduced our forecasted debt burden by $724 million. Unfortunately, recent changes to the Development Charges Act under Bill 108 are likely to reverse the majority of the benefits of Peel's growth management program, as development charge revenues are constrained and collections are deferred. Moving now to the non-residential proportion of property tax revenues for Peel, the hash marks on this slide represent Peel's long-term financial plan targets for the proportion of non-residential property tax revenue. Non-residential property taxes are a critical source of revenue to fund municipal services and maintain a state of good repair for infrastructure. As noted on the previous slide, new employment-related facilities are not being developed as forecast. We are not surprised then that our property tax revenue derived from non-residential property taxes or properties is also lagging. The proportion of Peel's non-residential tax revenue declined from 44% in 2002 to 36% in 2018, similar to the numbers presented by Matthew in his presentation. As a result, the property tax burden is shifting to the residential sector. Given the trends for development charges and property taxes, we decided to look at some other data that we had available. As shown on this slide, between 1974 and 2004, Peel's rate of employment land consumption was significant. However, between 2004 and 2016, the rate of consumption declined considerably. This data was consistent with our low rate of employment development activity and non-residential development charges. To better understand the issue, we dug a little deeper and we took a look at Peel's business sector. As shown on the left side of this slide, the number of business establishments has grown rapidly over the past six years increasing from 104,000 in 2013 to an amazing 175,000 in 2018. You might think things are pretty good. But 67% of all businesses in 2018 are establishments without any registered employees. Since 2013, most new businesses do not actually have employees. This trend represents another sign of the changing nature of employment. Next. We reviewed the data on the types of jobs that exist in Peel. First, looking at the chart on the left, over a 10-year period, job creation was led by no fixed place of work growing from over 30% or growing at over 30%, followed by work from home growing at over 15%, while employment and the usual places of work that we're accustomed to grew by just 12%. Now, changing patterns of employment have implications for their lack of required land use and ultimately is leading to lower municipal revenue growth. Now moving to the chart on the right, like many municipalities, job creation and appeal lags provincial places to grow forecasts. So not only is the form of jobs and business changing, the overall volume of jobs is also lower, contributing to significant shortfalls in development charges and property tax revenues. Based on the revenue, land consumption, business and job trends, we began to formulate a theory. First, like many, or like many of you, I enjoy watching Caribbean life, Mexico life, TV shows. I dream about the opportunity to work and relocate to an island country and work from there. It's possible today with technology. I see my chair is sitting in the front row over there and I chatted with him a couple weeks back about the possibility of um, Skyping into our council meetings and he's not quite up to that pilot project yet. But at the end of the day, I could have Skyped in for today's meeting from Mexico. That is how the world is changing. Second, since the 1990s, globalization has resulted in labor-intensive industries moving to Mexico, China, and other low-cost jurisdictions. At the same time, tax havens are being used to shelter income. Finally, we are witnessing an acceleration in the digital revolution. For example, I have two daughters, and on a regular basis, there are packages out waiting at my front door when I come home. 
my girls rarely visit the shopping malls. They are not alone, as I too have jumped on the bandwagon. Increasingly, society is point-click shopping. Today, we use Uber, Airbnb, online banking. Some municipalities are starting to, to accept cryptocurrencies, artificial intelligence, and robotics, to name a few of the changes that are taking place. All of these changes affect how land is being consumed, or so that was our theory. So now let me explain why we engage the Mowat Center. As shown on the, on the uh, far, uh, shown so far, the evidence suggests that there are transformative changes occurring. Peel's non-residential revenues are not keeping pace with our expenditures. We are experiencing increased uh, risk of stranded debt and a shift to the rising residential tax burden. Although we are a AAA municipality today, I ask myself, if these trends were to continue, will we be financially sustainable in 2041? To answer these questions, we needed to better understand this changing socioeconomic environment. As many of you are aware, the Mowat Center recently closed shop. We were fortunate to have our study completed uh, prior to them closing. Mowat released their report, Rethinking Municipal Finance for the New Economy. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to take a full read of, uh, of their report. It is available online, and certainly if you need a connection to it, I can provide that link. But today, I'm going to summarize their findings. The Mowat study concluded municipalities have a unique operating environment where we are creatures of the province with limited sources of revenue. Peel's revenue growth is not keeping pace with our expenditure growth, and Ontario municipalities receive only nine cents of every household tax dollar, possibly less after the latest provincial budget. Municipalities, or Mowat's findings, identified the following trends and drivers of the new economy increased immigration and an aging population, an increase in inequality, which includes a shrinking of the middle income class, an increase in non-standard and precarious employment, as well as significant technological change and labor market shifts. And just to think about this next line for a second, over the next 10 to 20 years, up to 42% of Canada's existing jobs could be automated, 42%. Looking out to 2041, we asked, Mo modeled several scenarios for us. First, in the business as usual scenario, trends for real wage growth uh, and increase in, uh, okay, we're on the right slide now, uh, increase in per capita government spending will result in higher property tax burden on households. If the current trend that we're seeing today continues, household property tax burdens will rise from 4% to 5%. You may think that's not a lot, but that is a 25% increase in the tax burden shift by 2040. This trend is likely unsustainable and politically infeasible. If the transformation accelerates, we will see large-scale job losses. Think of General Motors recently and Sears to name a few. Lower income and a further erosion in the commercial tax revenues and increases in municipal costs as more people will be reliant on social services. Under this scenario, the residential tax burden could more than double. Without diversification of revenue sources, essential municipal services may need to be cut. Mo would also model the impact of having a 1% municipal income tax. Under this scenario, municipal revenues can be stabilized and the property tax burden on households would in fact be reduced. We also asked Mo, Mo for some policy options and they proposed the following policy options for consideration optimizing development charges, which was a nice thought. Bill 108, though, seems to be moving slightly in the wrong direction. Tapping into the digital economy, so you think of City of Mississauga's tax on uh, Airbnb hotel tax. Increasing partnerships, like Innisfil's innovative public transit partnership with Uber. Avoiding the race to the bottom line by competing against one another to attract business. And you can think of the recent Ontario bid for Amazon, where we actually work together. And finally, cutting unnecessary red tape, a priority for this provincial government and all municipal councils. Some key takeaways from the Moat study are that municipalities have a heavy reliance on land-based revenues, and current revenue strains will only get more acute over time. Moat's work confirmed that municipalities are not benefiting from economic growth to the same degree as our senior levels of government. Municipalities may be unsustainable in the long term and the residential property tax burden will continue to increase and become unaffordable. To mitigate these risks, 
municipalities require a fair share of economic growth and prosperity. Unfortunately, senior levels of government are struggling to bring their own fiscal health in order. Senior levels of government rely on municipalities to deliver critical services and enable economic prosperity. I believe they cannot afford to see municipalities fail. Regional Appeal Council directed that we work with AMEL and FCM to take a long-term approach to educate senior levels of government on the risks to financial sustainability for all municipalities face in light of the changing nature of employment. Today, we've shared our findings with AMCTO, the regional and single tier CAOs, Marco, and here today at AMO. As we saw from Matthew's presentation, the changing nature of employment combined with limited revenue tools puts all municipalities at risk for financial sustainability. So how can you help? First, understand how your municipality is being impacted. And second, join Peel and AMO in our efforts to achieve a fair share of economic growth and prosperity for municipalities. Thank you. Thank you very much to Stephen and Matthew. We have about four minutes. If anyone has a question, there are mics uh, along here. And I will start with one then for Matthew. And uh, Matthew, when you started to dive, or sorry, what made you decide to do the uh, tax map? Why did AMO go that, down that route? Two reasons, I think, Lynn. Uh, the first is that it really drives home the point that we're, uh, we're really trying to make and that everyone is different. Every local economy is different. Every municipality is different. Um, and so we developed the map for uh, all of you to be able to compare uh, and understand how your results might uh, look compared to some of your neighbors or against the, the, the broader Ontario perspective. Certainly uh, at AMO, we're, we often talk about province-wide numbers to help make the case uh, to provincial officials and to the government and help them understand from a province-wide perspective how municipalities are affected. But often, in making that case, it doesn't capture some of the local uh, circumstances, and so we develop this map for how, to help everyone understand how things have changed over the course of the last uh, 17 years and to prompt some thought about what our next 17 years might look like. Thank you. Mike number five. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Um, a question to either. Um, how much, uh, if you look at employment, you see governments do nothing but pe financially penalize employers, right? You throw on your WS, I hired somebody, I gotta pay WSIB, I gotta pay CPP, I gotta pay EI, I gotta pay, I don't know how many, uh, health tax, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just wondering, as far as the drive to um, these businesses that don't have a physical place in our municipalities, um, how much do, do you think the, the ever-increasing property taxes plays in that? Do you want to do that? Does, does that make sense? Well, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at it first. I think, um, I don't know that property taxes are high on the list for employers in terms of wanting to locate into a municipality, often it's, they'll come where the talent exists. That's one of the primary drivers. Like when we look at development charges and property taxes, especially development charges are way low on the list. Uh, property taxes are a little bit there. Um, I don't know that the property tax burden is huge for uh, employers, but I think the, when you look at a lot of these companies, and we saw the presentation this morning, like Netflix operates in Canada. We don't go to the Blockbuster video store anymore. Netflix pays zero property tax in Canada. Um, senior levels of government have the ability to create new tax policy to find a way to tax uh, the digital streams of, of business. That would, distributing that revenue or giving the municipality some of that kind of flexibility, uh, take, some of the, take some relief off of the property taxes. I hope that helps. Um, yeah, like I say, I, I just think, I, I, I see um, somebody like an Amazon can compete so much more better if they're not paying all those property taxes like uh, Sears was or things like that. I just see it as creating an unfair playing field, kind of like Airbnb versus a hotel yep. that's got to pay property taxes plus uh, uh, a tourist tax and all that stuff. So that's how I see it. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. So thank you, Liz. 
Thank you so much. I'm sorry I was told that this was a hard stop because of the concurrent sessions coming up, but I will tell you that both Matthew and Stephen will be in the Trillium, Trillium Room on the fourth floor following this presentation to answer any questions you might have. The start of that concurrent session will be a Q&A on this topic, so you're welcome to take your questions up to the fourth floor. So thanks to both of our presenters. And that concludes the programming for this room today. So uh, go find your favorite concurrent session and enjoy the rest of the day. And we'll see you later.